your voice in song to the mighty one lift up your hands in praise fall on your knees at the throne of the holy one offer yourself to the ancient of days he is the light that shines in the darkness he is the rock that stands glory and honor and power be unto the lamb lift up your voice in song to the mighty one lift up your hands in praise fall on your knees at the throne of the holy one offer yourself to the ancient of days jesus christ is lord welcome brothers and sisters it's great to receive the opportunity to proclaim the word of god i hope you'll hear it i hope you'll share it we're going to talk about capital punishment. We're not talking politics. We're not talking sociology. We're talking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please stick with us. My name is Father Al Lauer. The program is called Daily Bread. We begin blessing you, reminding you you're baptized. You're a child of God if you're baptized. You're a son or daughter of God the Father. You've been adopted. You've got a share in the divine nature. You've got a new nature. You're an heir of the kingdom. No longer a slave, but an adopted child of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, just think of who you are in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that we will always believe and live who we are. And may we respect others in the same way. May we proclaim the good news of new life in your son Jesus. And in him there is no condemnation. And we thank you, Lord, for doing this. Amen. 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 We're talking about capital punishment. Let's get into the word of God. Matthew and chapter 5 and verse 38. There it is. You have heard the commandments. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You can add a life for a life. But what I say to you is offer no resistance to injury. Does he mean that? Look at Jesus hanging on the cross. Did he offer resistance to injury? Look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Peter says, well, let's pull a sword and let's fight it out here. And Jesus says, you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. He heals the man's ear that was partially cut off by Peter's attempt to um, go eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Jesus says, um, I know that's in the Bible, but I'm the one that wrote the Bible, so I can add to it and I can transcend it, and I'm doing it now. In the Sermon on the Mount, reading on Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard the commandment, you shall love your countrymen, but hate your enemy. My command to you is, love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. And what if you went up to a person and said, you know, we're going to put you in an electric chair and fry you. But we love you. We love you. <laughs> you lo we love you. How can you say we love you? We'll say, well, you know, that person's an enemy. Well, that, what does it say here? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. What's the point of this? This will prove that you are sons of your heavenly Father, for his Son rises on the bad and the good. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Well, if you, if you say don't offer resistance to injury and love your enemies is... You sure that, that means what it, what it sounds like? Look at Jesus on the cross. Okay, let me, let me talk a little bit here about, about capital punishment. As Catholics, and really not just Catholics, but just believers in the Lord, we, we've really got to bring us to the Lord now. Things have changed in some way. Um, the church is being inspired by the Spirit to to press this point in the, in the great, great encyclical, the Pope's letter to, to me and to you called Gospel of Life. And in section 27, 
Pope John Paul II says, and he's talking about uh, good signs that life is beginning to be respected, at least in some ways. Now, there's some real bad signs. In fact, so many bad signs, the Pope says we got a culture of death. But he says, well, there's some good signs, too. And he says, well, um, think of the, um, this is section 27, Gospel of Life, is the encyclical. Think of the daily gestures of openness, sacrifice, unselfish care. Think of um, what's happening in families, hospitals, orphanages, homes for the elderly. Um, think of, uh, and then he brings up, you know, we always say, yes, that shows a respect for life. And then I think he really surprises a lot of people. And he says, among the signs of hope, we should also count the spread at many levels of public opinion of a new sensitivity ever more opposed to war as an instrument for the resolution of conflicts between peoples and increasingly oriented to finding effective but nonviolent means to counter the armed aggressor. Now it's getting a little tougher to listen to the Pope here. You say, he ain't really giving us too much credit for having a big army and having the arms race instead of giving oh, well over 50% of our uh, trillions of dollars into the uh, military. No, it doesn't seem like he is. And then he goes on. You think you're having troubles with the Pope so far? Wait till you read this next part. In the same perspective, there is evidence of a growing public opposition to the death penalty, even when such a penalty is seen as a kind of legitimate defense on the part of society. Now, some people are against the death penalty in principle. Some are people against it in practice. He says, even when people think it's legitimate, they don't believe that it should be done. Uh, modern society, in fact, has the means of effectively suppressing crime by rendering criminals harmless without definitively denying them the chance to reform. You know, maybe if you were in a primitive world where this person is going to go right out and kill somebody, you would have to kill him to protect the other person. Of course, how do you know this person is going to go right out and kill somebody and say, well, he said so, yeah, but when he says he's not going to do it, that doesn't mean he's not. When he says he is, that doesn't mean he is. Uh, but, uh, but even if he is... Um, you know, we live in a high-tech world. And when you live in a high-tech world, you're responsible to use that in the right way. And we have some opportunities that other people that don't have or haven't had in the past. And we got to use those opportunities. Reading on Gospel of Life, Pope John Paul II, and this is in section 56. And here the Pope says some things that just really shocking. Pope Cardinal Ratzinger, the head of the uh, Congregation for the, um, for the Faith, and uh, he said, based on what the Pope has said here, we will have to um, um, expand on what was said in the Catechism. It, it, is not, um, it is not enough to uh, adequately reflect the official teaching of the Church. Uh, Professor Rice, a famous professor at Notre Dame in law, and a person who has written many things uh, showing the, what he would believe the legitimacy of the death penalty in principle. After he read this, being a faithful, obedient, submissive Catholic, said, I know I've talked about this. I know that this is what I have t taught, uh, and um, I just have to... Uh, uh, say even though I'm not don't, don't know if I accept it all intellectually perfectly I, I just say um, I'm going to uh, oppose the death penalty even though I've said just the opposite and kind of been famous for saying just the opposite but, be, but now the church has spoken and I have to basically say I, uh, I submit Section 56, Gospel of Life, Pope John Paul II says, 
The nature and extent of the punishment must be carefully evaluated and decided upon and ought not to go to the extreme of executing the offender. Basically, they say you shouldn't have capital punishment, except in cases of absolute necessity. Now, reading on, though. In other words, when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society, today, however, as a result of steady improvements in the organization of the penal system, and of course we have more jails than ever have existed in the history of the human race, such cases where you could never protect the society without killing the person, such cases are very rare, if not practically non-existent. Pope John Paul II says, well, maybe in the middle of some jungle somewhere, capital punishment might be legitimate. Now, that's even questionable, but he at least makes that a possibility or at least something it could be. And he's, But, you know, in the high-tech world, in a world where you got more prisons in the history of the human race and we got all kinds of ways of, of, um, of running these prisons with, with, um, with a lot of technological advances, uh, it's hard to say we couldn't protect society without frying them in the, in the uh, electric chair or giving them a lethal injection. And then the Pope says, Section 56, Gospel of Life, in any event, the principle set forth in the New Catechism of the Catholic Church remains valid. If bloodless means are sufficient to defend human life against an aggressor and to protect public order and the safety of persons, public authority must limit itself to such means because they better correspond to the concrete conditions of the common good and are more in conformity to the dignity of the human person. So if you could protect society without killing them, you got to do that. Well, we, we could easily do that. In fact, we protect society for many, many years without killing them uh, while they're going through the appeals. So obviously we can do that. Say, well, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, it's cost too much. Wait a minute. That's, that's the rationale of the culture of death where you put money above people. No, no, no. We can't, we can't argue like that. Now, so the Catholic Church, while not saying uh, that in principle capital punishment is wrong, that doesn't mean it says it's right either. It, it, it may not. I don't think it's an official teaching of the church either way. And you might say, well, sure it is. In the Bible, capital punishment's all over the Old Testament. But what I, what I read in Matthew 5, Jesus said that's what they used to say. Now I say something different. So there's, st there's still reason to uh, look at the um, New Testament revelation and say capital punishment is wrong in principle. But the Catholic Church has not said that. But it would say in a high-tech society, it is wrong in practice. Now let's just talk about the practical issues and then we'll go beyond what the church teaches, not against what the church teaches, but go further and talk about the possibility of capital punishment being wrong in principle, not just in practice. Why is capital punishment wrong in practice? Well, we already said we got prisons and we've already protected society from these people for many years. Um, so there's, we obviously can do it. So there's no reason for us to stop doing it except vengeance or save money. And, of course, that doesn't even work because you check how much it costs to execute a person. It costs more than keeping them alive in prison forever. But even if it costs 100 times more to keep them in prison, we should still do that out of respect for life putting life ahead of, of economic concerns. Um, so that's one issue, practical issue. Another practical issue is the, the whole pro-life thing. Even though this is different because pro-life, you're, you're trying to protect the life of an innocent elderly person protected from euthanasia, an innocent uh, baby protected from abortion, 
well, here this person is an innocent. But at the same time, the Vatican has said, yes, but it, it does uh, present for some people a, a, a sense of not respecting life as a supreme good. And um, <clears throat> it would be better to not have capital punishment because even though it's not exactly the same thing, it doesn't help a respect for life. And then a third issue, and quite, quite, quite an important one, and this is what the United States Catholic bishops have focused on, saying um, the capital punishment is applied unfairly. If you're a white guy and you kill uh, these people, you'll get life imprisonment. You won't get... You won't get capital punishment. If you're black and you don't have any money for a good lawyer, um, then you get capital punishment, or at least. So it's obviously applied unfairly. It depends a lot on, on uh, your social setting, your race, and especially your money. Well, that, that really is a strike against capital punishment, not in theory, but in practice. Okay, th that's what the these various points are the reason why the Pope and the Vatican say, there's, for example, no way in the world would the United States have capital punishment. And, of course, the Vatican has appealed to uh, various um, states and governors saying don't execute people, but obviously they, they ignored them. And um, I believe we have to go beyond the, the practical opposition to capital punishment and look at it in principle. I think in one way the reason the government ignores the church when it says don't execute this person is we're, we're still uh, talking kind of on a practical plane which isn't bad but it's not good enough. And uh, I think we have to start talking in principle. Uh, principles, biblical ecclesiastical, traditional uh, principles of the faith that would make you question whether capital punishment was, authentic, was, was legitimate under any conditions. And uh, one, the whole issue of the divine revelation about the, the worth of the human person. According to Genesis 1, God looked at the Pacific Ocean and said, after he created it, good, pretty good. And he looked at the Rocky Mountains and the Himalayas and all that, you know, these monster mountains and all that, and he just looks at them and goes, eh, that's pretty good, pretty good. And, and, you know, he looks at all these things and, he, you know, he says, good. And, uh, but then after he makes a human being, he looks at not just a human being, but he looks at everything and he says, very good. The human being is not only very good, the human being raises, elevates all of creation to a new level. Because of you, the Pacific Ocean is moved from good to very good. You are the crown of creation as a human being. You are in the image and likeness of God. And your dignity is based upon God creating you not based upon your worthiness or your activity. You don't lose your dignity by your actions because it was not gained by your actions. You, you can't lose your dignity. Your, your dignity is given by God. You can lose the appreciation on your part and other people's part of your dignity, but God doesn't change. Your dignity is based on what God has done. That you're in the image and likeness of God. No matter how much you defile that image, you still are good, very good, and you are still in the image and likeness of God, and you can never take away your dignity. You can act in a very undignified way, but that doesn't mean God looks at you differently. Uh, well, that tells you something, the dignity of the human person, but then it's much greater than that because when Jesus became a human being, well, then the dignity of all human beings was elevated much, much further. 
And then when Jesus died on the cross and purchased us at the price of his blood, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, gosh, our dignity was even greater and greater. This great, awesome dignity that elevated the worth of all creation was, was made much greater by the incarnation and much greater by Jesus' death and resurrection and the whole Paschal mystery. So um, can you kill someone who's not only in the image and likeness of God, but uh, a person, that, uh, a human being that God actually became and, and then bought and purchased at the price of his blood, can you ever kill a human being? Okay, a second point here would be Jesus died on the cross, not just for our benefit, but in our place. Do you, do you understand? There's, he, we should have died on the cross. We're Barabbas. We're the one who committed the crime. That cross is for us. That's the one that we're supposed to die on. He gets set free. We get set free. Jesus dies not just for our benefit, but on the cross designated for us. He takes our place. So when Jesus takes your place and dies for you, you don't have to die for yourself. You don't have to die to make atonement for your own sins. He did that. You don't have to be punished. He took the punishment on, your, on himself. Do, do you see what we're talking about in this whole thing? Um, all right, another point. Um, the issue of salvation. Now, Jesus died to save us from our sins. And that's so important. That's what God's interested in, that we all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Now, if that convict, criminal, murderer, rapist, whatever he is, and child of God, if he's a baptized Christian, and in the image and likeness of God, even if he isn't, if he or she, of course, women never get the death penalty hardly, which is part of the injustice of the whole thing. Um, if he or she um, is, is committed his life to Jesus, you can't, that's, that's not now just a, a creature in the image and likeness of God or a child of God, that's your brother or sister in Christ, because they have given their life to Jesus. They're your family. So how can you kill your own family? Well, what if they haven't given their life to Jesus, and even though Jesus died in their place on the cross, they haven't accepted that? Well, then you want to kill them and send them to hell? You think you want to keep those people alive? Give them a chance to be saved. And when you kill them when they haven't come to Jesus... That's not a good thing. Say, yeah, but we had to kill him. Why? To save money. You're not really saving money, but even if you were, you still didn't have to kill him. Well, why we had to kill him? Well, to get the to because the victim's family needs the satisfaction of seeing that person dead. Uh, I think we better read the uh, Sermon on the Mount again. Uh, that. That's the, that, we're not helping the victim's family by giving them a little blood to suck on. Um, we ought to lead that victim family to Jesus where they can get a, a real healing and, and not just um, some sort of uh, uh, demonic vengeance. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand people are hurt greatly by, by terrible, violent crimes. But killing the person that does it, what does that accomplish? Now, if you're not a Christian, I can understand why you'd kill them. But if you're a Christian, that's a problem. And, and if you're not a Christian, it's still a problem. You just don't have enough revelation. You just don't have enough truth to know it. Uh, so you, you see the issue. Three principal issues. One, and principle doesn't mean main, but I mean basic principles. One is 
the dignity of the human person because of being the image and likeness of God, because of God coming and becoming one of us in the incarnation and because of God dying on the cross for us. And then, of course, the whole issue of he substituted for us and took our death on himself. We don't need to be punished because he took the punishment on himself. And then the third point, principal issue, uh, would be the, um, this whole issue of salvation. If they're saved, how can you kill them? They're, they're your brothers and sisters. If they're not saved, how can you kill them and send them to hell? Is that pleasing to God? He wants all to be saved. When you kill them, you've made that impossible for them. And then three, three practical issues, and that's where the church is. They haven't really got to all the principles. Uh, three practical issues. One is this isn't good for pro-life. Two, it's not applied fairly. And the main practical issue is there's no reason to kill these people because we can protect society, and we have for years protected society without killing them. So there's no reason to kill them to protect society, which is the, the, the main uh, reason why that would ever be legitimate. It's never legitimate for, for vengeance, uh, but but to protect innocent people. But, but there's no reason to do that because we've already protected innocent people for years, probably 10 years while they went through appeals. You, you see what we mean. Father, we just pray that we would think the way you think, have the mind of Christ, be thinking uppermost, the dignity of the human person, pro-life, salvation, Jesus' death in our place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Of the Holy One, offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days.